Thank you. I guess um, all I'll add is real estate is a really interesting industry because it's often spoken about that innovation in real estate is lacking, it's slow, other industries are moving faster, but real estate is the most expensive thing you'll buy in your life. You know, if you think about real estate, it's two or three times the value of a Ferrari, 20 to 30 times the value of a Rolex. It's a really big decision. And the bigger the decision, the bigger the value of the product, the more the human interaction is important. Real estate is bought and sold on trust and on human interaction. And so it's very hard to scale that human interaction into technology. You can scale some of it, but not all of it. And so it really comes down to those real estate relationships between an agent, a buyer, and a seller. And real estate is, uh, technology and innovation is solving communication and workflow and those relationships. But you can't really take the people out, not today anyway. So the most successful real estate technology businesses, those that are innovating, are building tools to help those professionals do their jobs better. Oh, that's a really good point, actually. The um, Building the rapport in, in a sale is one of the most uh, critical things in getting sales done. Um, but they say that uh, interaction between any product or a service provider has to be about 12 interactions uh, before someone is ready to buy. And in the modern world, with you buying teeth whitening uh, or you're buying a Rolex, you might see something online many, many times before you decide to buy. But funnily enough, in the property sector, you might meet an agent once and then you're suddenly transacting with that person. And it's such a huge transaction. And, and I think there's inevitably going to be some distrust in that sector. It's maybe why people like myself, real estate agents, have such a bad rap in the, in the world is that um, we don't have a chance uh, to, to build that rapport that we essentially need and what consumers expect, uh, even when they're buying consumer products. Those are very excellent questions. I think the next one will be very, very relevant is that this is for Christian and Peter. What are the problems that technology is solving for property? So we'll start off with Christian, please. Sure. I mean, look, um, Peter, I might take them all up now. Um, here. I think one of the yeah. first ones is, is, is speed, um, you know, accountability, uh, efficiencies, safety, security, application, um, you know, visualization in terms of our technology uh, and geography. They're, they're the ones that really come to mind. Um, because they're, they're, they're the things that we're hearing all the time that people want solved. I agree with that. And I think um, I summarize it in, in one word, and it's the workflow. Um, and so real estate businesses have unique workflows, whether you're a property manager, a sales agent, commercial agent, we're sitting in a commercial space that somebody is managing, and there's a workflow, there's a process. And so certain parts of that workflow can be automated and improved. And that's really where the most successful uh, real estate technology businesses are scoring points at the moment, how you can reduce time, reduce costs, and increase the yield on the effort that you're putting in. Absolutely. Now we'll move on to the next one is addressed to all speakers. In what is considered a traditional sector, how do you approach property developers or real estate agents, as well as buyers to adopt innovation? How do you make the industry realize the potential with technology? Let's start with James. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, there's, there's a big thing in the industry. It's called WIIFM. So it's what's in it for me. And if you're a, a tech business, so I can understand who we're talking to here. Who here are in tech businesses? Does anyone here provide or, or create tech for the property sector? Yeah, great. So you might find that you're trying to sell your product, which might actually be to solve a solution that in that sector. But unless you can frame it in a way that you're saying to the agency that this is going to help you make more sales and more money, that's not going to help them. So you need to actually really focus on how is this going to make them the, the transaction with less friction, make more money with less effort and have leverage in the business. So if you can get your technology to solve that for an agent, that's how you're going to get in with the, the agents. And similar to the buyers, if you're going to try and get buyers to adopt a new technology, it has to be something that's going to make their life easier. They're going to enjoy using it uh, and it's going to get them to um, getting what they want. And what they want is a transaction where they uh, feel that they've built trust in the, uh, with the agent. They understand the product really well uh, and they've avoided pain and, and difficulty in the transaction. So if you can solve those, then you're going to be doing really well with the agent and with uh, the buyers. Sorry, what's the question again? All right, I'll repeat one more. In what is considered a traditional sector, 
how do you approach property developers or real estate agents as well as buyers to adopt innovation? That's one part. Second part will be, how do you make the industry realize the potential with technology? Well, I think developers, agents and buyers are three completely different areas, three di different people that care about different things. Uh, a real estate developer is really a financing scheme where you borrow money, whether it's equity or debt, you buy a block of land, you get the maximum yield out of it, you sell it and you move on to the next one. So it's very similar to any other type of institutional investment. An agency is, is a service business. They see a gap in linking people together and a buyer's stressing out, you know, about having to invest either to live in uh, or to rent out. So it really depends on what your purpose is. Uh, one of the things I've learned from my experience is that it's very important as a business to understand what your offer is, what are you offering, what's your promise, and who are you actually helping. Um, and so if you go out there as a graduate or if you're in the industry or if you're selling a product, what's your promise and who are you actually trying to help? Real estate and domain.com market themselves as tools for buyers, but they're not. They're making their money for agents. Um, so that's their promise. We'll get you the most leads. Um, so it's a broad question, but I think it matters on who exactly you're talking to. Absolutely. Christian? Geez, guys, you're making it hard. You're not leaving me much to talk about. Um, no, I think uh, I think with Peter, I see developers very much as transactional. Um, I do see the agents as people that provide a service, and, and obviously uh, buyers. Well, they're, they're moved because you know their pain points. So you have to really look at them as independent, independents because they all have very different needs, and they all have uh, very similar very similar problems, but they're actually different at the same time. So you know, when you're trying to enter any market space, uh, whether it be prop tech um, or fintech um, or disrupt any new industries, the, the key message that I always use when we're out there is, is communicate, um, educate and engage, right? So if you, if you can sort of target those three areas, you're going to have the greatest success. But in terms of how do you get adoption of innovation uh, in this industry, well, I, I've, I've knocked on a lot of industries. I've disrupted a few in my lifetime. Uh, this seems to be one of the most challenging. Um, and it's often a question of money, uh, which I find really disturbing uh, because as the, the guys have said, um, we're, selling, we're selling really high ticket items. So, you know, when someone's complaining about getting a photographer to do a shoot and they're paying 300 bucks, I, I'm, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. I don't get the concept. Um, but, Probably for me, it's about category growth. And um, if anyone's heard me speak before, I talk a lot about category growth. It's a bit like a mindset. Um, once you start uh, brainwashing everybody uh, in the context of you know, more prop tech discussions, uh, more venture capital, more seeds starts coming in, more angels come in, uh, adoption generally happens faster. So, um, you know, for example, uh, James uh, the other day connected me with uh, you know someone uh, the head of the head at uh, LJ Hooker in Sydney, and you know the conversation really escalated fast because they're already having that conversation with multiple players. So I think as an industry, we're going to see adoption much more rapidly. But it's going, it, yeah, and I think we're seeing it now. I think we're seeing the scaling effect. Um, you know, uh, I think you know, you, Peter, you guys at Cribs have raised some VC funding, so there's a, there's money now being thrown around. Um, and uh, and we're a little bit behind in, in Australia. Um, the rest of the the rest of the world is investing heavily. Um, and again, it's uh, people that are people that are investing at the moment are the people that are seeing the opportunity to say get out of real estate and go into software. So they're pe you know so they're, they're people that are really big agencies that are sort of saying like CBRE who are now investing in high net worth software businesses that solve a problem in their industry because they can see a long-term exit. That's fantastic. I think ultimately it's just solving a major, major problem in the industry. And I think the next question will be very, really relevant. This is for Christian Peter. Is that how security and privacy being addressed with the rise of PropTech? Let's start with Peter. I think security is an issue, not just for PropTech, but for every industry. Um, we've, we've gone through a period where my identity was my physical being. Uh, and some documentation somewhere. 
to my digital footprint, the way I interact, the way I look, and it's being held by a handful of companies that have very little accountability because of the way that they're organized and everybody's freaking about out about their privacy and no one really knows why. Um, but people don't like, you know, their, their details being with somebody else. And I think I don't, I'm not an expert. I don't know what the solution is, but I think there's an opportunity to lead and to lead, show by example. Um, real estate businesses are generally very bad at protecting privacy. You walk into an open home, somebody takes your name, number and details on a piece of paper and throws that, flicks it. And, you know, it's like, well, what are you doing? You know where I live and you have my email address and you know what I look like. Uh, or you sign a contract and you put your details there and, and, and your solicitor's details and they go and show it to someone else. Look, I've got a buyer and nobody knows what happens and we all get spammed by real estate companies selling us stuff that's no longer relevant to us. So it's part of a wider issue. It's not a real estate only issue, but real estate doesn't do it well. Mm. Christian, what's your take on this? Yeah, look, Peter's summed up the, the problem really well. I think there are solutions that are that are starting to come out because of exactly what Peter said. There's an incredible amount of awareness now. Um, and it's quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, there's always been an awareness. It's just a question of why has no one done anything about it? So, you know, I think in the property management sector, particularly, you've got a lot of property management applications now where, you know, everything's stored and encrypted. Uh, but then that brings rise to the next problem, which is cybersecurity in general. Um, you know, if you if you want to make some money and you're a developer, get into cybersecurity at the moment. That and space are just going gangbusters. You know, um, the boys at Blackbird Ventures are throwing money left, right and centre, uh, maybe because of their new outlandish valuations uh, that they're getting. But um, look, I think as an industry, I would tend to agree it's done poorly. Peter's nailed it. Um, but because we're aware of it, you know, we're able to start solving it. Um, I know that in our technology, we've got everything encrypted. Uh, everything sits on independent Amazon servers. You, you know, if, 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 if our product gets hacked, then Amazon's been hacked. So the, the likelihood is almost zero based on the way they'd run their encryption. But, you know, almost zero is not zero. So I think on a world scale, we've got a problem. Uh, and again, if you can solve it, and I'm, I'm not an expert, uh, I just know what we do, um, then yeah, I, I'm happy to invest in a business that has the solution. That's fantastic. Now the next few questions will be more about the future. Now, where, how do you see the interaction between buyers, sellers and agents evolving as technology enters the, the property space? So where do you see that? So we'll start with James. Yeah, this um, is, I think, going to become a bit more like the general consumer space. Uh, as tech evolves uh, and, and buyers and sellers start interacting more, I think the face-to-face -face interaction is going to fall away a lot. Uh, there's big companies out there doing things which is actually helping buyers become a lot more educated before they even enter uh, looking at properties. So real estate agents now are no longer the gatekeeper of information. Uh, the internet is widely available for them to search things. Anyone can get an RP data now and find data on, on a property. Um, and sometimes a buyer is even more educated than the agent and will actually tell the agent about what's going on in the area about approvals and things. So I think the face-to-face -face interaction is going to cut down. Um, I've seen some big businesses, uh, well, some of them are really opportunistic and, and coming around really big, such as um, online auction bidding. I'm not sure if anyone's seen that yet or, or bought a property by bidding online, mm -hmm. but soon you won't even need to attend uh, an auction in, in person. Uh, so market buy out of Melbourne are doing that really well and they've just entered the US market. Uh, I think that that kind of stuff is going to really become the main and the norm. Uh, so we spent four months in London uh, this year, uh, my business partner and I, um, and we met a lot of real estate businesses. And the view that we have as a business is that real estate is undergoing what stockbroking went through uh, maybe 20 or 30 years ago. I used to work in a stock space. Um, and my industry was disrupted. And what happened in stockbroking, for those of you that are old enough to remember, is you used to have a stockbroker that you'd call and they'll place trades for you. And then it became online and the industry fragmented. Uh, and everybody in the middle got pushed out and are still being pushed out. And so what happens is you have the cheapest cost producer, that's your Comsec, your E-Trade, your $10 a trade broker, 
or Goldman Sachs, right? That gets you in on the best deals on the street. And if you're in the middle, you don't really stand out. You're not cheap and appealing to the masses and you're not expensive and appealing to those that want to spend money and want to be serviced. And I think if you have a look at residential real estate, commercial has gone that way. So commercial is very institutionalized now. Your Dexas, your Lend Lease, your Goodman groups, they dominate the market because they're right at the top and there isn't really much. You have your little syndicates here and there through your accountant at the bottom. Residential real estate, your McGraw, your AY, your LJ hookers, and you multiply that in the US. There's 2 million agents in the US and there's a couple of hundred thousand agents in the UK. They're all very similar. The middle is very similar. And we think that will fragment. You'll have your purple bricks or your lowest cost producer right at the bottom that will sell your house for five, six, seven grand. And they compete on price like Comsec and E-Trade do. And then you'll have your excellent agent. When you're freaking out, and you're looking at your one or $2 million place and you don't want to go cheap, they're going to be very expensive, mm -hmm. but they're going to be expensive for a reason. And so this creates opportunities to either become the cheapest or the best. And we actually think that the opportunity is to become the best mm -hmm. as a business. That's fantastic. Christian, what's your take on this? Um, yeah, look, for me, uh, I, I guess I, both of the comments are excellent. I mean, uh, the, you know, Peter's take on it is is really refined. It's it's got you know lots of experience behind it in, in different markets. I agree, a bit like the stock industry. Um, I think we're being disrupted in the same manner. Uh, I, I think accessibility in general um, is 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 a challenge in our industry uh, or in the real estate industry. I mean, let's take property management for example, uh, and we talk and let's bundle security. You know, um, you got property managers. You know, I think recently, a uh, property manager went out to a site, never came back. So, you know, doing inspections is now risky business. I mean, would you want to do a property inspection in the Bronx? I, I doubt it. Um, and I mean, there's probably some suburbs in Sydney where you wouldn't want to do a property inspection, but it's got to be done. So, I think there's areas where this industry is going to really be able to be disrupted, whether or not legally. You know, I mean, can we fly a drone? through a house, someone's still got to open the door, or do we empower tenants and um, incentivize tenants to do their own inspections using, you know, 3D technology? Um, you know, as the camera cost comes down, you know, when you rent a home, you get given a camera and every month you do a walk around, you put the tape and you put the camera in the same spot. Um, and then therefore, you know, you now don't need an agent. If you don't need an agent to, to handle, you know, or property manager to handle that, what are the savings? So do the savings get passed down or do people make more margin? There, there's a lot of really exciting areas. I mean, we're, we're, we're working really deeply in that space at the moment um, and working with a whole bunch of people to really solve that problem. And if we can break it, we've been told, then we can just write a check. So, but there's laws, there's conditions, there's tribunals you've got to deal with. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of disruption across a lot of industries that needs to occur before that can happen. But I, I certainly think there's opportunities there. Uh, it's just about how how crazy are you and how far do you want to take it really? And how much money have you got in the, in, 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 in the bank? Fantastic. Now the next question will be for Christian Peter. Now, Christian, you mentioned a little bit about opportunity and we're going to look on the other side of the coin. What are the current challenges around emerging technology for real estate agents and buyers? So let's start with Peter. Uh, the challenges are like challenges of any other industry. It's not just real estate. Um, if you're trying to build a service, um, you really need to be creating a lot of value. And so if you think you've got an excellent idea that will revolutionize real estate, you really have to think what your value add is. Who are you helping? Do they want to be helped? Do they recognize they have a problem? Are they going to pay for that? Um, that's fundamentally important. We all come up with these ideas about how real estate agents can be better and, oh, wouldn't it be great if, yeah, but there's realities with who you're selling to, right? And so we have a model in Australia where, particularly in Australia, where the buyer is serviced very well. And there's businesses like BuySide, for example, my good friend Josh that runs an excellent buyer's agency. Uh, but in the US, it's very different mm. because the seller pays 6%, three to the listing agent, three to the buyer's agent. 
And so everybody in the US is serviced by both a buyer's agent and a seller's agent. So there's fundamentally a difference. So if you're going to build something, who's going to pay for it? And if an agent in Australia is making 1.5% and plus all the other costs and they have to split, do they have the capacity? And so you really have to think about, you know, what are you doing and who's paying? Absolutely. Christian, what's your take on this? Look, I, I, Peter, I think you and I must be related or we must have the same, same level of thinking. Uh, I just got no hair. But, um, yeah, I believe very much in, in selling value beyond product. So I think you were talking about value. So for me, you know, one of the greatest challenges is doing exactly that, selling value beyond whatever product you're actually developing, whether it solves a problem or not. I mean, I've seen... I've seen products across many industries that are completely useless and yet they sell bucket loads, right? Why? Because normally they're two or three years um, ahead of actually solving the problem that gets developed by actually that new solution. So, and that's really clever. If you can get into that space, um, you know, you've hit jackpot. Uh, I haven't found one of those yet. I'm, I'm working on it. You tend to lose a lot of money when you're looking for those. The other one, those people, um, and I think going back to Peter's point, people, we, the industry has the same challenges other industries have. That's the point Peter made and I 100% concur. The biggest one is people. Uh, and it really comes back down to that point of education and educa sorry, education engagement, both from the buyer side uh, in adoption um, and also interacting with whatever solutions being created. Uh, for example, um, and it sounds like I'm just giving ourselves a press, but one of the things that we really pride ourselves on, we identified in the market that in property management, uh, owners, uh, landlords never wanted to look at 150, 200, 300 photographs. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but you know, a property manager will go through a house and they'll take up to like 800 photos. Don't ask me what, because even when we've gone out and done inspections with people, they'll take the same wall seven times. And it's like, why are you doing that? Now, you know, what we're doing is we're overlaying AI using 3D tours, um, so the AI does it. Remove all human interaction. Um, now, that's a work in progress because there's a lot of big data that needs to be developed for that to occur. You know, we don't have an Alexa or a Google uh, in every home that's collecting all your data and information, every conversation, um, you know. But for us, you know, it, the challenge is people. It's, it's getting them to accept that, you know, the industry is going to be disrupted and, you know, there are going to be opportunities. But for us, solving the problem where the, the landlord never wanted to have a look at it, now they literally guide themselves through a 3D tour. They're done in four to five minutes. And there's hotspots throughout it where it says, hey, look, Mr. So-and-so, um, we, we noticed there's some wear, general wear and tear happening in this home. Can you please, uh, you know, what do you think we should do? Should we paint the home for the tenant now? Whereas before, that process was really onerous. But for us, even trying to get agents to adopt it they're like oh no 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 that we don't understand how artificial intelligence work well you don't need to that's the whole point you just need to adopt it so you can't get away with saying that you have to educate and you have to work through it so again it goes back to my point the biggest challenge is more conversations like this with people that are doing it so that the rest of the room is engaged then they have the courage to have that conversation so um you know, really exciting times and very big investments to make that happen. Exciting times indeed. Um, so let's say if there, there's new companies into this new prop tech, how do you go about raising funds and seek investments from venture capitalists? So we'll go back to you, Christian. What's your take on yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, look, uh, VC funding is, is an amazing thing. I've, I've raised a bit of VC capital across multiple industries. Um, this has been one of the more challenging ones. Um, I, you know, I raised money for a, a global website uh, that we built back in 05, um, uh, you know, and, and raising money then was was challenging, not as challenging as 08. All right, let's be very clear. There was no money in 08, 09. Um, we know why. Um, a couple of guys at Goldman Sachs decided to do a few dodge, but and the rest of the world collapsed. But um, I think the raising money is again about conversations. Okay. So, you know, we work closely with the big four, um, you know, anyone trying to raise money out there, um, you know, you got to understand what people are looking for. So, you know, angel investment, you know, 
20 to 100,000. There are angels out there that will put up a million bucks. Don't discount them. You know, Melbourne Angels are very famous for doing that. Uh, the Sydney Angels are, are good. The Brisbane Angels are about half a mil. Um, Adelaide Angels are about 20. Okay. So, uh, you know, that's how far behind we are in South Australia. I'll pay myself out. Um, but, um, you know, you got to know where you're at, which stage of raising you're at. And that's the biggest mistake. You know, when I was the entrepreneur in resident uh, for a think lab at the University of Adelaide, that was the biggest thing that I had to teach people was know where you're at and don't don't underestimate. You're better off being foolish and asking for five million and you end up with a million than, you know, rate going, oh, well, I actually need a million because your chances are you're going to give away 50 percent of your company and you're probably going to get five hundred thousand dollars. So. That's that's my take on going out to raise, um, but there are a lot of family held money. Uh, Peter, I don't know where you guys have just raised, but there's family held estates right, that are looking at moving out of real estate. Okay, so there's concerns around that. It's you know, and, and remember we have a lot of new old money. Okay, so. It, you know, if you talk the Rothschilds, for example, in in you know in in Europe or in in, in America, that's seriously old money. You're talking, you know, generations, generations. But Australia, when I we talk old money, it's like three generations, and it's people that moved here, you know, like 100 years ago, 150 years ago, acquired a stack of land, and then as land values went up, so we're seeing a shift. Uh, and I think capitalizing on those people who see an opportunity to move away from something they've done forever because it is that that formation we've been brought up with things. You know, these things have destroyed our lives, right? But you can market to anyone anytime. So look, to me, raising money again is conversations, but you know, if you're starting off, make sure you know at which point. Um, and you know, we're in the middle of a, a big raise. I'm actually in the middle of three. Uh, but if for our for augment space, we're we're just about to start a very big raise, and we're we're actually targeting all of those different levels because we're going in for C, even though we're probably should be Series A. But we've actually fully bootstrapped. So we've never needed them. Um, but now we kind of like want to scale. Uh, Christian, there was a few moments where you were breaking up. So. For someone who's doing prop, uh, prop tech, feel free to contact Christian and ask him your questions. I'm sure he'll be more than happy to answer that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so for Peter. Um, thanks, Christian. That's, it's always interesting um, when, you, when you hear somebody that's gone through it. Um, they oh, explain okay. it like Christian because it's such a long process and you know, it's, it's, it's like having battle scars, uh, I guess. You can always see a soldier with a lost limb has been to war, so it sounds like uh, you've, you've fought a few battles. Just out of interest, anybody here interested in raising money for their own prop tech business? Is is it something that's important to you guys? Okay, it doesn't sound like it, so I'll keep it. I saw there was one gentleman. Oh, okay, there. cool. Yeah, cool. It's <laughs> it's um, it's a process like everything else. Uh, we raised money from PyLabs, Property Innovation, they're Europe's biggest property VC fund. Um, raising VC money is very different to raising private money from your friends, family, high net worths. VC is a very structured process. Um, we're very proud that um, PyLabs, out of 450 applicants, um, they pick six. Uh, and we were the uh, first Australian company that they've invested in. Um, so we went away, we took that money, we helped it to grow the business. And um, if you do want to raise money as part of a process, and you have the end in sight, and you know that VC investors are important, probably not a bad idea to raise VC money right from the beginning because it's going to give you the governance, the structure, the framework. If you don't want to necessarily build the next unicorn and you don't need VC money in the future, then just figure out who's going to add value to your business. Is your Uncle Fred, you know, a really experienced guy that can't, that has business experience, take money from him. You know, it's all about... You want to, if you take money, you have a responsibility. Taking money is a responsibility. And for every responsibility, you want a reward. And so if I owe you money, um, I'm going to want something in return. That's why we borrow money from the bank, right? I go and borrow a million dollars, but I'm buying a house. 
So the upside is my reward. It's the same with taking money from any investor. Know what your promise is, know who you're taking money from, know what they can add to you, and think about the future. Is this someone that will help me according to my plan or not? Do you have an extra Uncle Fred I could call? Uh, no. <laughs> All right, this is the final question before we go into the Q&A. I think everyone will be very interested in this one. So what does the future look like in property tech in 10 years' time? Any predictions you have on how the market is changing? Now, we'll start off with James. Now, James has been quiet for a few, few turns. Thanks. I don't really know much about uh, VC <laughs> funding, so <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I think, like I touched on before, I, I think that the human interaction is going to drop away a lot, and it's going to become, like Peter was saying, is that there are going to be the experts and there's going to be the cheaper services. We've seen recently uh, Purple Bricks uh, fell away from Australia. I don't think that's because the service offering um, is bad. Um, I think it's just it, was, it wasn't maybe the right timing for them. It was a, it was a wrong method of entering the market. Um, they certainly stirred the pot here in Australia with how um, they perceived or made the market perceive agents. Um, I think another business um, enters with a similar style. I think it'll go really well. Um, I certainly think that um, we, we're going to see more intuitive uh, technology come about. So. When you're on Facebook or Instagram, you'll typically be fed ads where you think, gee, that's really serendipitous. I was just talking about that with a friend. Um, are they listening to me? It's not the case. It's actually that their, their algorithms are so good and they understand your demographic so well that they're feeding you things that they understand. Um, and that's where actually funny where Peter's business is going to come in to play with this is that using big data to help identify trends and uh, people's interests so that you can be marketed to specifically. Um, and and I, I think that's really exciting because you'd be sitting there thinking, I think I might buy a, a house in Bondi. Um, and then you just think that. And then suddenly a house in Bondi pops up and it's just because of the, um, the content that you've got in all your pages, groups and um, uh, what you're posting. And it says that's a, a match for that person. So I think more intuition is coming and, and less human to human interaction. Thank you. And Peter, I know that your company does more of AI, so this would be really relevant for your field. So please. Yeah, I think um, instead of boring you about AI or, you know, you're all smart people and you're probably across it and you're here for a reason because, you know, you, you are across these things. The way I think about it is I've got no idea what the future holds. I never like predicting the future. My stockbroking days taught me don't predict because you'll usually be wrong. But when I go buy my food, there's one of two or three companies that I'm usually buying from. It's Woolies, Coles or Aldi. Uh, when you think about buying a phone, it's either a, a Samsung, Google or Apple. If you think about banking, the big four banks own 80%, 85% of the mortgage market. Um, and I can keep going on. And my point is that real estate is very fragmented at the moment. There's a million people doing the same thing inefficiently. And if you have a look at the big money that's being raised in the US, for example, you know, WeWork has raised a few billion dollars, Compass has raised a few billion dollars, Open Door. There's a handful of companies that are raising the lion's share of money. And I think what you'll have is a real estate industry that's going to be a lot more confined, where you have the market leaders that drive everybody else out, the same way that Woolies drove out the local grocer and the local butcher, same way that the banks drove out the building societies. It's, I think that's what you're going to see in real estate. I've got no idea how important AI will be. Um, I think people interaction is still going to be very important, it's still going to be a people business, but there's going to be big household brands like we have with any other valuable industry. That's fantastic. And Christian, what's your, what's your take on this? Man, you two make that really easy. So for me then, I'm just going to wrap that up with, I think transactions will be mobile, uh, if not embedded in you somewhere, uh, and everything will be on the go. So I think we'll be using, you know, cribs to uh, to serve people constant data and ads, and we can, we're already consuming more rapidly than we've ever consumed before. Um, uh, you know, there's data coming out of research that, people are actually becoming smarter at so much information and what's happening is that you're getting people who are actually saying well yeah I've, my brain can grow because you know I've got a gigantic head uh, and so there's a bigger brain but really what's happening is people are saying I actually really enjoy what I'm doing I'm interacting with it. I'm, I'm going to grow and learn from that so I think we're going to be served data uh, so easily that then selling and marketing is going to become second nature. It's almost 
in, in, in encrypted within your DNA. It's part of your fabric. So for me, transactions in this industry will be completely mobile and on the go. Uh, I believe there's always going to be a human element. I think, you know, in 20 years time, you know, people will be like, you know, it'll probably be a robot. It'll probably be actually a robot on the other line. I mean, this, 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 you can make calls now where you're actually talking to an AI, to a bot, and you wouldn't even know that it wasn't a human because there's no more lags. There's, you know, so, so I think that's where we're gonna go. Again, I'm with Peter and, and, and James. I can't predict the future, but I can tell you now, I reckon a lot of it will be mobile and a lot of it will be on the go, if not all of it. What a way to wrap up. Uh, we're going to our Q&A. <clears throat> so any volunteers of Q&As? We will have a mic around to pass it. Uh, Liz will be passing around. Yes, we have one over there. Um, Liz, on the, your left. Testing. Hi there. Um, my, my background was financial services, managed funds, stocks, that sort of stuff. And I've been in the real estate industry for about four years now. And, and originally I came in because I thought there was going to be change occurring, the sorts of things you're talking about, where there will be, um, you know, micro transactions would convert into larger transactions. and. Um, I, I guess one of the things that I, I've sort of stumbled upon is, firstly, I, I've, I've thought that the world underestimated the infrequent nature of, of the behaviour in property, and, and that coupled with the fact that you're dealing with people's assets that are sometimes 10 times their annual salary versus, you know, convenience things at Aldi or, or trading stocks, which might be 20,000, 10,000, whatever, or even their super fund, hundreds of thousands of dollars, that to me creates the, the, the inertia around the property industry and why it is what it is and why it's still very much people driven because you get mum and dad that sell maybe twice in their life. They upsize and they downsize maybe. Maybe there's a couple of other bits and pieces, but they aren't frequent and they are novice and, and the, they, they fall into this fear mm. And the fear then creates this, this hysteria about, well, we should deal with the guy that's in the local area even though we know that People are saying that in research, just this and that, whatever. And and the purple bricks thing is a great example of why it didn't work because they they thought, well, it's cheap, good. Should we just invest? Um, just wondered your thoughts about those comments. Thank you. Um, I saw there was one in the front. I might um, I'll, I'll address um, gentleman's comments. So um, I think you're right. I think with um, with big transactions, people like to have that comfort of having uh, someone hold their hand, which is where the expert comes in. Um, but leading up until that point, um, there's a lot of research and nurturing that goes on that people might be actually unconscious about. So um, when they're thinking about selling and there's this transactional period that happens every seven years, over those seven years, they've actually been monitoring the market. They've been watching what their neighbours are doing. They've been watching what the market's been doing. And it hasn't been a person who's been feeding that to them. So it's been um, lending itself even more and more so recently to technology, feeding them the information they want to make that comfortable decision with their hand being held. So the, um, the agent at the end is really that comforting person to get them to commit to something after the seven years of data that they've been fed automatically. So I think that the, um, that's um, exactly right. Like the, um, even though it's infrequent, the, uh, the nurturing campaigns that are going on more and more now are going to become uh, more complex and, and uh, more detailed for each uh, buyer and seller to really address what they're looking for. I'll just add one little thing. I think you put it perfectly. Um, Purple Bricks decided to leave Australia. It's not necessarily that they didn't get traction in the market. It's that they got their unit economics wrong. They spent too much money on marketing and they had a problem managing staff. And it's not that the model won't work. It's just that that particular model around those unit economics and the people running it didn't work. So Amazon, for example, leading into the tech boom was one of the most um, best performing stocks. It actually fell 98.5% from the top of the tech boom to the bottom, and today it's one of the most valuable businesses. I do think what Purple Bricks has done is it's created an opportunity to be a cheap agent, and, and cheap agents can be done better, and I think we'll see more of them in the future. No one's cracked it, but hey, it's a five, six hundred million pound business now listed on the London Exchange. So. Um, I do think that that cheap category will get better. Thank you. There, there was a question in front. Christian, do you want to add anything, bud, before we go to the next no, question? No, I think on that one, I think you guys have nailed that. and I think it's a great question too. Um, so 
so um, my question follows on from some comments that Peter made about consolidation. One of the things I've noticed is that the big disruptors and the obvious examples are like Uber and Airbnb and maybe Uber Eats, if you treat that as a separate business, they're global businesses. Um, so if, if we're going to invest in startups here in the real estate tech industry, we would have to think global. Is that, is that a fair statement? And what are your thoughts? Absolutely. And we've got the most successful prop tech business in the world here. And that's REA Group. It's listed on our market. It came out of a classifieds business. So REA Group owns realestate.com and they also own realtor.com. Uh, they also own Move Inc. And they're around the corner in Surrey Hills. Um, they came out of a classifieds business and today they make $1.2 billion of revenue. Zillow is uh, the number one player in the US, but they're actually 25% owned by Caledonia Investments who are around the corner in Circular Quay. Uh, Domain is a $2 billion business and we're actually, if you have a look at the most valuable property technology businesses in the world, we, we represent them pretty well. Uh, today um, there was an acquisition of Rockend, which is a property management business. It got bought out today by a US company. So I think we as Australians do a fantastic job in exporting real estate technology. And I think having spent four months in London and some time in the US last year, um, they are behind uh, because they're very locally focused. Whereas we know in Australia, you can't build just a local Australian business. You have to build it to export it. So very early on, we start thinking about scale because Australia is not enough to justify to investors and we have to build something that works overseas. That's, that's my personal opinion on it. Christian, do you have any comments on that? Oh, Look, uh, I, I think that, sorry, was that me? Did you ask me? I was just cutting out a bit. Yes, Can you guys hear right. me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So look, absolutely. And I, and I don't think it's just about prop tech. I think in Australia, if you're a startup and, you're, um, and you've got something, you've got to have a completely global perspective on it um, because we are just too small. We might be this massive continent. Right, but we have what 20, 22 million people. I I don't even know. It feels like it never actually gets any bigger, no matter how many times we open up migration visas and entrepreneurial visas. But um, you know, uh, it, 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 for me, going global is the only outlook any startup should have. Uh, if you're studying entrepreneurship at university, it you know the, the concept of born global is what they try and teach you now. It's funny when you get academics who have never started a startup teaching you that, but um, the concept is you gotta be born global. So, and in, you know, even in, in our case, um, you know, we, we know that in Australia, uh, our market size is about 175 million. Uh, if you combine India and the US, it's 7.5 billion for the same product. So, you know, if, if you're gonna go out and raise, if you're gonna go out and have that conversation, you, you've gotta actually be ready to go into those markets. And, and that's, it's much more by the way, than just saying it. You know, like you actually have to live, breathe it. You have to have the economics. Uh, you have to have the scale. I mean, you know, Peter, you, you've obviously had experience abroad. You're experienced in now raising VC funding. You know, you've got to build your technology stack around the globalization. You just don't have a choice anymore. How about James? Yeah, I think definitely right. Um, with building anything which has anything to do with consumer behavior, the consumer behavior here in Australia is built on the exact same psychology and emotion uh, here as it is in the US or Europe or India. Um, people are buying for the same reason and it's to feel good. It's the only reason people buy anything. And if uh, your technology is centered around consumer behavior, it doesn't matter if it's built for Australians or if it's built for someone in Sri Lanka, um, their motivations are the same. It just has to be translated to meet the regulations of, of the location. And I think that might be where some challenges will be that property sectors have different regulatory matters but if the core behind it is getting to people to make decisions or getting businesses to make money based on transactions, it'll work here, it'll work overseas. Yeah, it's logical. Absolutely. Uh, do you have any Q&A on this section? This gentleman, please. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just maybe some comments on the, the future role of the, of the, or the emerging role, improved role of the buyer's agent or, and that function or like, where, where does that sort of go? I'd love to talk about that. 
Um, I think buyers here in Australia are really underrepresented. And um, we've grown up in this culture here where the uh, seller is always represented, uh, but the buyer is not. And it means that the seller has someone who's an expert in the market and, and effectively feels like um, they're, they're represented by uh, someone who's got their interests at heart. And they do. They have a fiduciary obligation to act only for the, um, the seller, the vendor. Uh, but the buyer is out on their own and they don't have representation. And um, I think now, though, buyers, given that there's a lot of um, sentiment in the market about various things going on with uh, defects and um, uncertainty about buying and regulatory things, they need someone in their corner. And, and I think people are willing to pay a, a fair price uh, for that service, uh, expert service, um, so that when they make a decision, they know it's a confident one. Um, so I think that's a, a, a really tiny area right now which is going to boom in, in the next few years for sure. And to what extent will tech augment what they're currently doing? Uh, similar things like I was saying before, streamlining, um, I think effectively research is one thing. Um, Ten years ago it was hard to get an RP data report to understand values in an area and you had to rely on an agent. Uh, nowadays uh, you can get that online pretty easily, uh, but it's translating that data. So you can be given data. Um, but understanding what that means is the big thing. So I think that uh, a buyer's agent gives that human interaction, which is essential in translating the data into what a decision might be in the end. Um, and then also being able to take the emotion out of the negotiation. So uh, with technology, you might find that it's a really good platform just to collect data. Um, I use one called Rundle, and it's basically like Facebook for business. And um, when I act as a, a buyer's agent, um, I put all of the uh, data that I discover in there, and it's a single platform for people to review. So it's no longer losing an email in in the system; it's all kept in one handy place. Um, but yeah, uh, I actually don't like talking about things I don't know about. So buyers agency is a specialised area, but I think one point I'll make is that with any service provider in real estate, um, what you provide today is going to be commoditized so you have to continue to step up in the value chain knowing what the comparable sales were down the road 20 years ago somebody providing you that was well today you can get it so the the value they have to do more in negotiation that art and that element um again yeah. shout out to josh from buy side right at the back you know he's 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 um an excellent buyer's agent that uses technology builds it in his process and I'm sure he'll agree that the way he's thinking about his business, the things he's doing today are not going to be the things he's going to be doing in 10 or 20 years' time. Can I add that? And um, Christian will be able to add to this because it's about his technology. Um, I, I think that his augment technology is going to be huge for buyers' agents. Um, when they're dealing with a, a remote client uh, and they need to see properties and they're seeing multiple properties, they don't want to see hundreds of photos which they're when you see lots of properties, it's hard to connect images along the way. They all blend into one. Um, whereas uh, what Christian's providing is a holistic view of a single property in one spot. If you can put that into a portal and a buyer can see that, it gives them a much more immersive experience of the home without needing to actually go and inspect the home. And that's really the role of the buyer's agent is, is being an extension of the buyer. Um, so Christian might be able to talk about more about that if it, if it can be used for that, but I'd love to see it used for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, thank you, James, for that plug. Uh, I don't think I have to say anything else. Uh, that's exactly the tech stack that we've actually finished and uh, we've just trialled it with uh, a couple of really big players. Um, looks like we're rolling out part of that to 22,000 properties in the next um, uh, six to 12 months. I think it's going to take more like 24 months to get all of those people on board. But it's very exciting because we spent six months actually working in the field. And I think, as I said earlier, in the conversation, the biggest problem that we've wanted to solve was getting the um, landlord actually involved because a lot of the uh, property managers kept saying, they don't even want to look at this stuff. They don't want to engage with it. And I'm like, seriously, man, I own property. I don't want to see 300 photos every two or three months. And you probably summed it up really well, James. It all blends together. When you're flicking through, they all look the same. You don't know what you're looking for. Then you've got to go into the notes. Well, with us, you literally just walk around the house. Eventually, the AI will pick it up and say, dear John, this is the observation. And John goes, oh, I should either not be a tight ass and paint the house, or I should find a way to get the tenant to paint my house. 
for me because you know that's the way these guys think right so um you know we're gonna get there um and if anyone in the room's got a spare couple of million i'll take it right because uh, vcs <laughs> as peter said uh, are very very tough and uh, and i i look I, i'm a chairman of a whole bunch of companies so i'm all across uh processes and systems but you know in in this area where you've got to you've got to take some dives in the direction you've got to support the clients that are supporting you to develop tech to, to de develop the tech uh, rapidly because as you know as gary wenichuk says there is no substitute for speed in this industry very well put we have one question in front yes uh, i'm seeking some sort of clarity about ai and uh, uh, robotics as it applies to property sector um, the way i see it is uh, can look at trends in the US because they're at least five years ahead of us. But I'm trying to exclude um, big data through social media in your sort of effect on the on the uh, workflow. Sorry, I'm not sure if I understand that question. Well, AI and robotics, like it's, it's clear terms, but how does it actually apply um, at a real level in a business? I mean, excluding big data and uh, that's sort of ruling out a lot of small businesses. So how does, if you exclude big data, what's left, how is AI relevant in real estate? Is that is that a fair, fair way to phrase that? Is that correct? Yeah, and also looking at trends in the US. Looking at trends in the US. Well, I think there's a couple of different things there. Um, on AI, it can mean a lot of things. Um, to put it very bluntly and to be very honest with you, the application that we, for example, are doing today is more automated rules and automated workflows than actual fully blown AI in a true scientific sense. Uh, that's not to say that the aspiration isn't to get there, but you need to build things that the market's ready for and that the market will pay for, and it needs to be commercial. We're not a CSIRO, government-funded lab, for example, that can, we're a commercial enterprise, and so you need to meet commercial reality. In terms of the other part of the question, which I think I can add a little bit more value to, is the trends in the US. And one of the biggest trends in the US is the iBuyer market. Anybody heard of the iBuyer? iBuyer market? Anybody know what it is? Anybody want to take a, take a guess? Make it a bit interactive. So what's happening in the US is um, you want to sell your house, a company will buy it and pay you within 48 hours. And so there's a company called Open Door, there's a company called Knock, Zillow's going into it. It's becoming a big thing. Instead of waiting 60 days to sell your house, they'll buy it, they'll pay you, they'll disperse the funds in 48 days. They'll take over the house, they'll put a smart lock on it, they'll fix it up, they'll list it, and anybody can go and inspect it 24-7 using their app. Oh. These businesses are growing. They're the trends that don't have AI in them, for example, that are attracting big money. WeWork, Kosher, you all know what that is. That's the biggest prop tech, uh, privately owned prop tech business in the world. Um, so they're, they're the trends that are really raising the big bucks in the US at the moment. I might um, talk about, if you're looking at, um, maybe not strictly AI, uh, but certainly automation, um, there's certainly more coming out with, with sales, um, with uh, Messenger, say Facebook Messenger, and, and automation of interaction between a buyer and an agent through Facebook Messenger at midnight. And it's like we were talking before about when you call up and, and you're speaking to a bot, but you don't realise it. Uh, that technology is getting better as well with Messenger as well, so you can ask questions and the bot will reply um, with uh, intuitive responses to give you the intel you need. And you've never spoken to an agent but you've learned about the property, you've learned about the agent, uh, and you feel like you've been talking to the agent because the bot speaks in the same language and tone as, as the agent as well. Um, and, and as for AI for, for workflows and things, there's actually a business as well uh, called AIRE, A-I-R-E, and uh, they produce um, effectively workflows for uh, property management businesses and out of CRM, so it pulls out the data of who you should be contacting next, um, who's gonna be your hot buyer or hot seller. Uh, so it reads all the data in there, and I couldn't tell you how it all works, uh, but that sort of thing is emerging. So an agent will turn up to work and say, oh, I've got to call Sally, because the computer tells me to. So AI, in its true sense, the 
machine will make its mind up and choose who the best agent is. An automated workflow is you build a set of variables and the computer will make up its mind based on the variables that you set. One is probably a bit more applicable today. The other is where we're going. It's not very amenable to AI. Um, like compared to the legal industry, they can write the rules into the system. But in property, it's so much to do with emotion and um, market conditions and the person, like, how can you prescribe some sort of system for it? I'll cross over to Christian because I know that they, they, they have similar aspirations. But one of the things I'll add is when Amazon started selling books, they never probably envisaged to be the largest host of data in the world, right? So you get there as a business. The aspiration is there, how you get there, what you get to. You, you know, a book online bookstore today controls all our data and we're all building our, our technology stacks in that environment. So I don't know, but we're experimenting with it. We aspire and whether it works or not, we'll see. And Christian, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, look, um, I've done a bit of work with some companies that have gone off, not in property, but in terms of machine learning and um and you know i guess setting rules and, and to sort of answer your question how do we how do we do it in property exactly how we've done it in embryo research um you start with a set of rules a set of conditions so you've got to look at it like a scientific experiment and you set a set of rules that are based on the parameters and the intelligence that you have available and then you start letting the machine make its interpretations and obviously you don't let the machine go crazy and do shit on its own, um, they have to comply to those rules because at the end of the day, it's just a mismatch of code, right? So, you know, and machine learning, and a lot of people don't know the difference. You know, they, they all think AI is the same and Peter sort of touched on it quickly. It's machine learning is, is where you really want to be, but we are still a long way away from getting that right because the law, as, uh, as the general, as, as a person said, the law, um, isn't ready to let machines make decisions. So, you know, this, this, you start, so the easiest way to describe it is you start with a set of rules, you set the foundation, you allow humans to navigate those rules, you let the machine learn a little, and that's uh, Peter's point, that's what we're doing. We're overlaying images on images on images on images. We've got a lot of rules in there. Um, a, what we're trying to do is actually break it. So we're actually trying to see if the machine is, capable to actually do what a human can do, which, you know, you'd think, oh, yeah, machine can do it. But until the machine's learnt, it's like a baby, right? It's got to learn to sort of stand up. Uh, it's got to actually learn to crawl before it stands up. And, and then, you know, it's got to fall a few times before it actually starts to walk. So a machine's no different. Just because it's fast, you still got to do that. Does that answer that? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right, final question. I, I believe there was one over there. Thank you. Is that working? Um, I had a question just about blockchain because we haven't mentioned blockchain and uh, the applications of uh, blockchain in the, the prop tech sort of sector. If you could comment on that. Uh, it's not an area that I know much about, so I'll pass. Um, I can certainly see it becoming um, an element which is going to cross over to PEXA. Um, which is the um, going to change the way that we transact on titles. Um, it's uh, blockchain is a much more secure um, method to transact any data, and and it's not. I think people need to get out of their head that blockchain is Bitcoin. Um, it, it is not just a currency. It's a, a trans. It's um, a smart contracts. Uh, so if you have a property title, and I was talking to a guy the other day, and he found the old property titles of his house, and they were these one meter handwritten sheets. And um, that's soon, I think, going to go the way of uh, blockchain technology and transactions. Whoever holds the keys to that holds the property. And um, we're already seeing that now when we're talking, uh, what Christian was saying, with everything going mobile with transactions. Uh, I think that soon, and it is starting now, is that DocuSign and signing on glass is becoming the um, uh, becoming more of a, uh, an interest with lawyers. Uh, there's a few law firms who are doing that as standard, uh, like Law Lab. Uh, you can sign on glass any day of the week there, and all the contracts are held electronically. So, yeah, it's definitely the next step. 
Um, Krishna, any final comments on that question? Look, I spent my five bitcoins on pizza when they were worth a dollar. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I actually did have some bitcoins early on and I did do all right at the end. But um, yeah, look, probably the only thing that I'm going to comment on in terms of blockchain, it's still miles away. All right. So, you know, there's a lot of talk because it's again, it's that industry category growth. Uh, the people that want to make it work are talking about it a lot. Um, where we're going to see blockchain uh, escalate is when the banks actually uh, adopt it. I know that Commonwealth Bank have got a uh, pretty significant investment in uh, a department um, that they operate and run. So as soon as they adopt it fully, then we're going to have to learn about it. But I think for now, the biggest thing for me um, is that I, I, I just try and do things that can make me money now as opposed to things that can make me money you know, I think too far away. I think right now AI, like I said, cybersecurity um, is is the big is the big play, and it it'll disrupt industries. Okay, so it's cross functional. Uh, but other than that, I you know I want to thank the uh, four people that are in the room because that's all I can actually see. Uh, no, apparently there's a lot of you. Um, so and you know it's it's good. I'm not feeling as bald because I can see the back of some people's heads. Um, but no, truthfully, uh, I think it's been a really awesome conversation and uh, you guys have given me heaps of insight. I think I might have to uh, buy a house in uh, Sydney. So if there's any buyer agents in the room, I'll, I'll just move over there and hang out with you guys. Thank you for the final comment. Um, I hope you guys all find value and information on this event. Uh, give a round of applause to our panelists again, please. Now, I know you guys some, might have some questions, so we're going to go into our drinks and this. So during that time, feel free to reach out to any one of us for any questions you might have, okay? And say bye to Christian. <laughs> bye, guys. Have a good night. Enjoy a couple of drinks. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. No worries. Thanks, Lulu. Okay. Say bye. Ciao, ciao.